in which development meets the needs uh, of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And engineers have a vital role to play in creating systems and solutions that address things like the climate crisis and support much more sustainable use and management of our natural resources. Um, today, you'll hear from a panel of the Academy's Chairs in Engineering, em Chairs in Emerging Technologies. These are highly prestigious awards that identify global research visionaries who are going to lead major research, translation, and innovation programs around key emerging technologies. The idea being that they want to facilitate technology and commercialization and creation of significant UK economic and social benefit. Um, the panel will share different approaches to advancing sustainability, uh, the application of their novel engineering technologies and the benefits to society and the economy. By introductions, I'm Alok Cha, I'm the science correspondent at The Economist um, and in, um, someone who's been writing about the technologies of, at all stages of their lives for more than 20 years. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here to introduce you to these visionary leaders we're going to hear from. And the panelists today are Professor Richard Dinsdale the, from the University of South Wales, Professor Judith Driscoll from the University of Cambridge, Professor Ian Saxby Metcalf from Newcastle University, and Professor Magda Fitovici from Imperial College London. Each one of these will give um, a short introduction to their work, and then we'll be asking questions, and there'll be time for, at the end, of course, for you to ask, to ask questions as well. So let me leave it to them for a few minutes to introduce themselves and their work. So Professor Richard Dinsdale from the University of South Wales first. Hello, my name is Professor Richard Dinsdale and I was awarded a Royal Academy of Engineering Emerging Technology Fellowship in 2020 to research the area of bioelectrochemical systems. I'm speaking today about how my Emerging Technology Fellowship can advance sustainability both in the UK and globally. Societies worldwide have a common set of challenges to overcome to ensure that they are both environmentally and economically sustainable. These principally include the provision of clean water, reduction in their emissions of fossil carbon dioxide from their chemical and fuel usage, and the reduction in the amount of waste they produce and the encouraged amount of recycling resource recovery. By achieving these aims, we not only protect the environment, but facilitate increased resilience in societies to deal with various internal and external challenges they face. In my Royal Academy of Engineering Fellowship, my research will find some of these solutions to these challenges and hopefully lead to their successful commercial deployment. The scientific phenomenon I'm researching and exploiting is the process of extracellular transport in microbes. This ability for bacteria to transfer electrons is using a technology called bioelectrochemical systems. Microbes are widely used in a number of industrially and environmentally beneficial processes to treat sewage, produce bioenergy, but also produce more high value products such as pharmaceuticals. However, current processes are somewhat limited in what feedstocks they can use, the range of products they can produce, and the amount of carbon dioxide they release. What I am seeking to do is improve and then scale up the metabolic efficiency and diversity of bacteria so they can make a wider range of products by integrating electronic systems with biology, i.e. develop bioelectronic devices. Bacteria can be considered to be tiny electrochemical machines in that they convert organic compounds into electrons and new bacterial cells. In a few but expanding range of bacterial species, these electrons can be captured and used to monitor bacterial metabolism, be stored as energy, or be used in other processes. In many cases, they also have a close interaction with metallic compounds found in rocks. This close interaction with metallic compounds not only leads to a number of questions regarding the metabolism of the organisms, but also the opportunities in metal chemistry. At laboratory scale, these bioelectrochemical systems have been used to treat wastewaters, including sewage, recover valuable metals, and act as biosensors. If we reverse this process and supply extra electrons, we can produce hydrogen gas 
And if also we supply excessive levels of carbon dioxide, we can use these bioelectrochemical systems to produce a range of non-fossil fuel derived green chemicals. Today, my research group, as well as other researchers globally, have shown these potentially useful sustainable processes working at lab scale. But to deliver the benefits of this technology to a wider society, then these processes need to be scaled up, whilst being as still as efficient, reliable, and as cost effective as compared to conventional processes. However, although this industrial challenge is significant, we can bring together two great scientific achievements of the 20th century to develop this platform technology. These achievements are the development of microbial biotechnology through the understanding and manipulation of DNA and the development and widespread use of electronic devices. I will use this technology platform to address three target areas for improved sustainability, advanced wastewater treatment, strategic metal recovery, and the conversion of industrial and atmospheric carbon to green chemicals. Initially, I will be concentrating on waste water treatment. In conventional waste water treatment, for example, my aim is to replace the existing activated sludge processes, which is used globally to treat domestic sewage, but is energy intensive, produces significant quantities of recalcitrant sludge, and provides poor treatment for pathogenic bacteria and leaves significant quantities of personal care products and endocrine disrupting compounds. It's in envisions that bioelectrochemical systems will remove the biochemical oxygen demand pollution of sewage without the excessive aeration energy cost, produce zero or very limited quantities of calcium waste sludge, break down personal care products and endocrine disruptors, and generate in situ disinfection products which can remove pathogenic viruses and bacteria. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Judith Driscoll. I am the Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies in Advanced Memory Materials, and I'm based at the University of Cambridge. My group's broad research theme is the engineering of materials for low power electronics and new energy devices. As you may know, all eras of human development have been driven by advances in materials. For example, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age and the Silicon Age, which came in around 50 years ago. Moving into a new era of sustainability, our lives will likely not be driven just by one material type, but by more complex systems, closer to nature, involving the assemblage of different materials in different forms and at different scales. Considering the climate emergency, which is already on our doorsteps, we don't have any time to waste in engineering our green future. And materials play a very important part in this. So does information and communication technologies, or ICT, which my project is linked to, contribute much to power consumption? In fact, in Europe, it accounts for nearly 10% of electricity consumption. And this is rapidly increasing. We're now in an age of big data, and it's getting bigger all the time. Data is growing exponentially. Around 2.2 billion gigabytes of data are created in the world every day. In 2016, 90% of the world's data ever created was in the two previous years. Artificial intelligence is significantly increasing the growth in data processing. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is a science of training machines to imitate the human brain. It has been enabled by a huge explosion in CPU power. It requires the crunching and training of massive amounts of data, and it consumes a very large amount of energy. The world's data centers use more than one terawatt hour of energy per day. This is equivalent to the electricity from one million wind turbines or 20 nuclear power stations. Considering how quickly AI is growing, predicted to consume one fifth of the world's power by 2025, Within just a few years, around 500 new nuclear power stations will be required to fuel this growth. Even some developed countries will not have sufficient power to sustain this growth. Non-volatile memory-based technology using memristors could be game-changing in ICT. Memristors are electronic memory devices in which resistance can be programmed and subsequently remain stored when the power is removed. 
They can act as both memory and computing elements in a single device, achieving in-memory computing or neuromorphic brain-like computing. The Marista technology has clear advantages over competing technologies in terms of density, cost, switching speed and CMOS compatibility. A dense crossbar array of memorista elements can mimic the structure of the brain which has parallel architectures connecting a myriad of low-power computing elements or neurons and adapted memory elements, synapses. With memorista arrays, AI speed, training ability and efficiency would be significantly improved. Efficiency by up to two orders of magnitude. However, after more than a decade of intense effort worldwide, Serious challenges remain with Memrista systems, in particular the ability to miniaturise them, to make them uniform and to increase their endurance. These problems all stem from the use of non-optimum materials and the lack of precision engineering of them at the atomic scale. My Royal Academy of Engineering chair is geared towards achieving ultra-dense, very fast, very low power Memrista elements based on oxide-thin films. I'm very fortunate that the chair is soon to be augmented by a European Research Council advance grant entitled Efficient and Robust Oxide Switching, or EROS, which starts early in 2021. I'm also fortunate to have a lecturer in Cambridge working with me. Her work focuses on a new plasmonic characterisation tool to probe the switching mechanisms in remristers at the nanoscale. Her work will help me to understand how and why our materials behave as they do. My group's research provides completely new thinking in the materials to be engineered. We're exploring new thin film systems with specially designed ionic and electronic channels with carefully controlled charge carrier concentrations. We're determining the optimum compositions to be used, guided by both experiment and calculation, and we're learning how to fabricate them using industrial methods. In the near future, we aim to build test devices and demonstrate highly controlled switching in nanoscale elements. We already have significant success and progress in idealised model systems to guide us on our path. Overall, our work has potential to create a new technology for reducing power consumption of tomorrow's computing, eliminating the need to build scores of new nuclear power plants or other power plants for our burgeoning data age. My name is Ian Metcalf and I'm Professor of Chemical Engineering at Newcastle University. Now, I started my Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies in March of this year. And my chair is about new approaches to reaction engineering for a low carbon future. Clearly, hydrogen and hydrogen production are going to be important in that future. And in particular, in any transition to a low carbon future, it's going to be very important for us to be able to produce hydrogen efficiently from fossil fuels with carbon capture. Here, we don't want end-of-pipe treatments. What we want are new technologies which build carbon dioxide capture into the process and improve efficiency at the same time. Now, conventionally, hydrogen is produced by steam reforming of methane or natural gas. We mix the methane with the steam and then we react them together to produce a mixture of hydrogen, water, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So we produce hydrogen very early in the process. What's difficult is now extracting hydrogen from that mixture. So to do this we perform some further chemistry and we react remaining carbon monoxide with remaining water to produce more hydrogen and more carbon dioxide. And for thermodynamic reasons we need to do that twice. So at the end of that we've got a mixture essentially of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. We separate the hydrogen from the carbon dioxide using a process called pressure swing adsorption. So overall, it's a complicated process. It needs three reactors, it's, and it's got a difficult separation. And the initial reforming step also needs a lot of energy. So we have to burn additional natural gas, and we have additional carbon dioxide emissions. Now, things could be done very differently, and this is where my chair comes in. What we're interested in here are using cyclic processes to make things work better. So here, the idea is that we're not going to feed methane and steam in together to the reactor at the same time, we're going to feed them in separately. And we hope with this kind of approach that we're going to be able to design simple reactors for many energy related processes. So let's imagine that we've got a material and this material is really, really good at storing oxygen. So we take this material with oxygen already stored within it and first of all we react it with methane. 
Now, the methane grabs that oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide and water, and it leaves behind a material that has no oxygen and really wants to grab oxygen. So in a second step, that's why it's a cyclic process, a cyclic process, a second step after the oxygen has been removed, we expose the material to water. The material grabs oxygen from the water and it produces hydrogen. And it produces the material, of course, a material that is now rich in oxygen again. So we need to repeat the cycle. But with some clever materials design and some clever thermodynamics, a cyclic process of this kind can be used to produce pure hydrogen from a single reactor. So now you can understand with this approach and with this materials engineering and with this, with this thermodynamics, what we hope to be able to do is design cyclic processes, otherwise known as chemical looping processes, for, uh, to be able to perform the energy chemistry that we're going to need in that low carbon future and in particular in that transi transition to a low carbon future. Hi, hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Magda Titiric and I'm a professor of sustainable energy materials at Imperial College London in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Last year I was awarded a chair in emerging technology from the Royal Academy of Engineering to ensure that the way we build our future energy storage and conversion technologies is truly sustainable. Sustainability means avoiding the depletion of natural resources to maintain an ecological balance. As it was said at the beginning of this meeting, sustainable development is about meeting our current needs without compromising the well being of future generations. So, if we think of these definitions, the approaches we currently use to build our renewable energy technologies are not sustainable. This is because we rely on materials choices that are limited and geographically constrained. Hence, we need to learn from past mistakes we made with the fossil fuels and build a future society based on clean energy. So we have six degrees centigrade increase um, that are predicted to happen by 2050 if we don't act decisively on climate change. So, of course, the question is, where are we heading then in terms of climate change? Um, we already reached the peak of our CO2 emissions, and we must go to net zero emissions by 2050, as set by the UK government and the European Green Deal. Therefore, we need to act on this decisively now. So, I believe the sustainability moved from something that would be nice to do to something that we must do and is about what we do right here, right now, and how do we inspire the future generations to carry on. So in order to do that, we need batteries to electrify transportation and store the electricity that is generated from intermittent renewables such as wind and solar. We also need electrolyzers to be deployed at large scale for green hydrogen production from water splitting. We also need efficient and affordable fuel cells to be able to convert that green hydrogen into electricity and also to build fuel cell powered trains, buses and trucks. We also need efficient materials able to convert solar energy into electricity as well as renewable fuels and chemicals. So today all these technologies are built using scarce materials. Just to give you a few examples, in lithium ion batteries, we need cobalt in the cathode. And this is unethically mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, often using child labor in artisan mines, destroying the ecosystem and generating significant CO2 emissions. The same is actually valid for lithium itself. If we take the example of Bolivia, where China has monopolized all the lithium resources. So with the accelerated development of lithium ion batteries technologies, both the UK and the European Union are missing the needed supply chain. In my fellowship, I plan to develop innovative energy storage technologies, batteries that will go beyond lithium ion and will be based on abundant elements such as sodium, potassium and aluminium. 
Another example of scarce materials are iridium and platinum, which are the catalyst of choice for hydrogen production from water and its utilization in fuel cells to generate clean electricity. The current available supplies for these metals cannot sustain the expansion of such technologies as a global scale. So we need alternative electrocatalysts for hydrogen production and hydrogen use. In my fellowship, I plan to take widely available bio waste and convert it into engineered advanced materials, which will be able to replace such scarce catalysts while putting the UK towards a zero waste, zero pollution path by building a circular economy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, all four of you, for outlining how you're going to be using your um, your um, emerging technology professorship. Um, a whole range of technologies there. There's so much to talk about, and I'm going to ask you all to just describe in a little more detail um, the kinds of challenges you're facing. Um, but before I do, I just want to let you know in the audience for everyone watching, you can ask questions too. And the way to do that is to go to your Zoom um, chat window, Zoom, Zoom window, and look in the Q&A box and type in your questions there. So just type in a question there and uh, we'll direct it to the right uh, person. Unless you want to sort of specifically speak to one of the uh, speakers then, and please do let us know. So um, I'm going to ask some questions first, and then and then we'll come to the audience questions um, as well. Okay. So let's start. Let me start with Professor Richard Dinsdale, um, who talked about uh, you know biochemical process engineering for carbon reduction and you know recovering resources. Um, Professor Dinsdale, you you talked about the kinds of things you're going to be looking at, but I'm just curious, just in general, a, a lot of what you talked about is very specific. Uh, complicated technology, how easy would it be to scale what you're doing to really take advantage of the enormous amounts of waste that are produced? Because ultimately, it's, it's one thing to have a solution in a laboratory, but how, how does one scale these things? Isn't that one of the big challenges? Yes, it, it, it is a, a significant challenge, but the, uh, the beauty is that we can start off with relatively small cells and uh, we can test those, research those, and then we can add them together, either serially or in parallel, and then we can expand and expand to larger and larger units. But by starting off small, we can actually have a, you know, a better learning experience. We can start to engineer them, improve the engineering, and improve the manufacturing as well. And so, uh, although it is challenging, is that we, it, it, we have two sort of great ratchets of engineering is that by continual improvement and practicing many times and directed engineering we can scale it up that way so it, it is a challenge but we can bring many tools that have been used in engineering before to bring up mass manufacturing and is this something that engineering students are also thinking about we think about um sustainable uh, well when we think about sustainability in engineering people are might, you know, rightly or wrongly think about you know, fantastic new technologies. And we'll talk about some of them, lithium batteries or the, what comes after lithium batteries, better memory, all that stuff. Um, dealing with the stuff that we're using already and recycling it and re making it better. Is that something that engineering students are already thinking about? Or are they just thinking, I need to go and produce something in Silicon Valley or, or something like that? I think from the students' point of view is that they're increasingly interested in this area of engineering. And also it begins a sort of clever engineering because you can start to engineer products, not only to be good, but be better and recyclable. And, and I think that uh, you know, students are looking, what are they going to do 20, 30, 40 years time? And by you know, building in that recyclability, reusability, robustness, that, that's a definite interest because it, it, it's a more interesting chance of making more cheaper, faster, you know, let's build stuff better. Yeah, it makes it, it builds sustainability right in from the beginning rather than something that's bolted on at the end, right? Yeah. Um, Professor Driscoll, let me uh, talk to you to ask you to explain a bit more about some of the things you you uh, introduced. Um, you, you talked about how you, you essentially you're thinking about computer architecture, how chips are put onto uh, circuits, and how we might use them in a more energy efficient way. We've got to this point, as you very eloquently said, about 
we're using so much data, we're using so much computing, and it only goes up. We're only going to be using more of this stuff. Um, and and it's, it's using up lots and lots of power. How do we reduce that? Well, one is to re re reorganize entirely how the chips are, are built. You talked about neuromorphic computing, something I've only vaguely heard of. T t tell us what that is. You said it's brain inspired. What does that mean? I think you're muted, actually, Judith. Yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. So I mentioned in my talk how, how a little bit about how the brain works with um, memory elements and also computing elements, you know, so um, heuristas and synapses, and they're all interconnected together. And so the brain does like in memory computing, it combines memory and computing together. So what we want to try and do at the moment, you know, your standard computers, they separate these things. You have the memory, you have the computing and you shuffle bits of data in between these two and back and forth and that that well that, that slows things down of course but it also uses a lot of power so the idea is to try and do more like the brain does so the brains has you know has iron channels flowing um, across the the memory elements and we want to do the same kind of thing so we're going to build materials that have iron channels in them and that they have narrow channels like the brain has so at the moment the silicon based technology doesn't work like that and standard memory technology. So our little memristor elements, like um, iron channel elements flowing like as in the brain, will replicate how the brain works. And so you don't have separation of computing and memory. So that's one aspect of it. If you can create that, that's wonderful. So it will do everything better for AI. So, you know, the speed and efficiency would be wonderful. You'll save power by two orders of magnitude. That's, that's difficult and certainly to create something that's like the brain in three dimensions is not easy. But even that aside, even if you just improve the memory part and just have memristors and memory elements that are very efficient by resistive switching processes, that will be a great advance as well. So we're gonna start there just with the memory part and then we're gonna see how that takes us on to the neuromorphic part. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean there's, there's some quite big concepts there about changing the architecture of computing and, and, and making it more like the brain. Um, I just wonder, uh, you know, right now, I heard some crazy statistic about how much energy a computer uses transferring information from its memories to the processing bits and backwards yeah. and forwards. That's essentially a large, if not the majority of what, what the energy a computer uses. So if you can put all those things together, it seems, it seems really sensible. Why weren't computers built like that in the first place? <laughs> I mean, this is a really silly question. Well, but for, the we very them... for the very reason you're saying to create that kind of architecture is not easy. Hmm. And, you know, you're starting out with bits of silicon that you have to process and, and make very small. And um, so, and the, and the technology for the computing and the memory were developed separately and they are different, you know, technologies. So it does require a completely new way of thinking. Yeah. And just, just one final question. And just one final question on on, the, on that type of um, the sort of the next generation of computing, if you like, is um, is you know the the kind of computing you're describing, where if you put the memoristors together and and you have computing and processing in in a similar space, um, will that give us a picture of if it works and we build manufacturing processes to to make these things, which in itself is not a simple thing to do. Um, say that happens in twenty or thirty years time. Do you see this replacing standard silicon-based computing or will it just augment in some way? That's a very good question. It depends, of course, as you mentioned, it could be a very complex process and I guess it will in the end depend on the complexity and the cost. So if it's, it, the technology is likely to be quite complex and costly. So you would not replace, you know, your standard laptop, you know, but for very high power computing for your data centers, you you likely would but not not in your everyday goods yeah it would so build it's up likely to be augmentation rather than complete replacement but you know it's a whole new area so who knows yeah. and 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 it's it's likely to give us much more different ways of using computing in different whether it's a, a desktop computer or more at the edge where you know where where people live okay uh, professor metcalf and um, again we're talking about the future here when um you know, I was, I was reminded about the fact that when you talked about hydrogen and the hydrogen economy, we, I mean, I, as, as a reporter uh, who's covered green technologies for a long time, I hear about the hydrogen economy all the time. And 
we see it as something that will be incredibly useful and clean when it arrives. Um, and I'm glad that people like you are still pushing forward in it. But how confident are you that the hydrogen economy is the one to go for rather than just fully electric everything? All right. Um, well, I think I was I was I deliberately try, tried to um, sort of um, frame my work and, and, and frame the problem in terms of what's necessary for an energy transition. So I think yeah. we've got a lot of different things happening at the same time here, haven't we? And actually, it would be great if we could make that leap just in one go. But we've got uh, we've got new technologies, clean technologies coming through. We've got new technologies for, for, for trying to use fossil fuels to generate energy. And we've got them both, if you like, developing very quickly. So I think what we're facing in the future really is a very complex optimization for society, is which technologies do we follow in the interim? Which, which, which technologies do we bank on for the future? And how do we phase out technologies all at the same time? So it's a very interesting and complicated problem where I think we're going to need a range of solutions. And the solutions we use is going to change with time. Yeah. Do you see hydrogen as something that um, has um a tr sort of an element of you know transition towards something um much more sustainable in the future or do you think that there will always be a need for uh something like hydrogen whether it's in a fuel cell for cars or or mm -hmm. or for, for other pipelines and things and wh where does it fit in the sort of medium and the long-term future well I, you knew we, we obviously we all, we all hear about we all hear about talk of the hydrogen economy I, i'm never quite sure when we talk about a hydrogen economy to, to me that doesn't necessarily mean moving a lot of hydrogen around so you, you hear people talk about uh, the importance of methanol, and you probably hear heard people talk about the fact, why, why don't we capture CO2, for instance, from a, the flue gas of a power plant and turn that into methanol? And why don't we then use that methanol as a fuel? And actually, what you're doing there, when you burn that fuel, of course, you would then emit CO2 back into the atmosphere. So you've got to be very careful here what you've actually done there. Although you look like you've used methanol as a fuel, what you've probably done is you've hydrogenated carbon dioxide from the flue gas to make methanol and burnt it to make CO2 and water. So actually, you've used carbon dioxide as a hydrogen carrier. You haven't sequestered CO2. You haven't actually, in the, in, in the round of things, you haven't taken CO2 out of the atmosphere. You've used it as a hydrogen carrier. Um, so I think what you, might, what, what, what you need to think about as well is how we move hydrogen around, how we store hydrogen, what forms of carriers that we use. And a hydrogen economy, it's possible in the future, might not have a lot of hydrogen in it. <laughs> But effectively, hydrogen is being carried around in maybe liquid forms, in other forms, it's being stored, and it's a low carbon energy economy. So I think hydrogen perhaps can be a little bit misleading. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point, actually. Um, but I, I think it, it speaks to one thing about hydrogen, which is that it's a very, uh, if you like, very energy dense material, uh, even, uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's so good, but it's very hard to keep in place. And very yeah. hard to manage, right? Yeah, that, that's the thing. Metric density, yeah. In yes. terms of based on its weight, not so much based on its volume. Yeah. No, no, no. Let's let's not deal with those uh, particular problems right now. But no, it's 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 the material that gives you most bang for your buck if you could actually store it. Just one final question for you, then. Um, you you your uh, chair is going to be looking at all of these different ways of creating hydrogen and building the part, certain parts of that economy. Um, isn't it also true that storing this stuff is actually really quite difficult? Um, yeah. Where are we? Where are we on that? And how will you or your colleagues be looking at improved ways of storing it? Um, right. Okay. Let me. Let me if I can give you a very simple example here, just maybe to provoke thought. It's not the answer to a lot of our problems, but we we talk about hydrogen storage. When we talk about hydrogen storage, I think we picture having hydrogen in cylinders, etc. We might even think of it maybe in the form of methanol. But let me just maybe to, to provoke debate. Imagine. What would happen, and it, this relates now to chemical looping technologies, imagine having some iron powder that has, is in its metallic form, it's a fine powder, and actually when you move that around, and you can move that around quite easily, conventionally, when you want hydrogen, what you actually do is you contact that with water vapour, and actually that will form iron oxide and produce hydrogen. So there are other ways of moving around hydrogen, if you like, where it's not actually in the form of hydrogen. This relates then to how you store the hydrogen uh, and, and how you distribute hydrogen. Yeah, so we need to th think more laterally about where hydrogen is in the, uh, in the chemical equations that we're, of the things that we're dealing with uh, all, all around. Um, yeah. Professor Titiuchi, you, you talked about sustainable energy materials uh, for the future, um, especially battery technology that goes beyond lithium. Um, I feel like we've just got used to lithium. So um, uh, well, why are we thinking of replacing it already? And it's such a useful and very good way of, you know, having lots of energy in a small, in a, in a very light sort of package. 
Um, because like with everything that is great and we thought it's a good idea, it turned out that there are severe drawbacks. Uh, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing lithium ion batteries. Uh, it's a fantastic technology. They got a Nobel Prize, well deserved. Um, but, um, you know, for example, according to the World Economic Forum, um, by 2030 is considered that the manufacturing of lithium ion batteries will emit around 190 megatons of CO2, which is more than the entire Holland emits today. Um, most of this comes from the manufacturing of active materials um, and the manufacturing of cell. There are serious bottlenecks with the availability of the supply chain, you know, where do we get? So again, um, there are predictions that the use of lithium will increase by a factor of six, cobalt by a factor of two, and nickel by a factor of 24 by 2030 because of lithium ion batteries. And where are we going to get all these resources? They're not infinite. So while there might be a great technology for cars, um, long distance cars. We need to think of alternative technologies for energy storage, for short distance transportation, for aviation, for more safe batteries. So it all depends on the requirements. I'm not saying that we'll get rid of lithium ion batteries, but, but also AIM said there will be a lot of available technologies that will have to coexist depending on, on which application and what. And I think if we are going to be stuck only with lithium ion batteries, we're just not it's just not going to be very sustainable long term. Yeah. How important is it um, that we recycle the batteries that we use already? Uh, I mean, it's something that's become um, important for the public consciousness. Uh, there are regulations now about how you dispose of batteries. And I think people are more aware that you can't just throw these things in the bin um, and that they should be taken somewhere to be disposed of or recycled properly. How important is that in the sort of long term uh, production and development of batteries? So again, um, we are expected a significant uh, growth in the lithium ion battery sector by 20. So I think we're gonna reach around 3,600 gigawatts hour in 2030, that's predicted. So you can imagine exponentially the increase of cells. Currently, recycling is not really there. It's just something that we've stopped thinking about, but there is no other way than going circular with batteries. And going circular with batteries can be different ways. Can be, for example, taking batter lithium ion batteries from EVs and using them for stationary storage later on. Um, there is also then taking these batteries and recycle them, mining the materials from it. But this is also quite energy intensive. What we shouldn't do is pile them up somewhere in a hole in the ground because that's not going to be the future. So this is something where I think, and also I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good market for business at the moment. You know, if you, if you want to be rich in the moment, in the future, probably you should invest in lithium ion batteries recycling. Yeah. Yeah. My project doesn't specifically look at recycling. It looks like, different alternative technologies. However, I'm, I'm also very interested in recycling and also designing these things better from the start, designing it for disassembly, for recovery. Mm. And, Which is, I, I'm sensing a theme there about engineering being something where the, the, the for sustainability purposes, designing in recyclability, it seems to be an important thing for all of it. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. One final question for you, um, Magda. Um, if, you, if you were to predict one or maybe two of the battery technologies that you think are going to be the equivalent of, you know, in popularity of the, the, that we have now for lithium ion, what would it be? What should I be looking out for? I mean, I personally think the next to come will be sodium ion batteries, just because the technology is so similar to, to lithium and the infrastructure is already there. Um, and just because they've been a lot of development is already almost commercial in China. China has already demonstrating small EVs based on sodium is ideal for city transportation and stationary storage. There's no cobalt needed in the cathode. Sodium is available. You use aluminum as a current collector. And so I think that's going to be the next thing. Cost is still a little bit high. So, you know, with some more reductions in materials and cell manufacturing cost, I think 
that's going to be the next in a few years. Okay, well, we'll hold you to that. We'll come back to you in 10 years to find out. Um, Richard, uh, there's, a, there's a question that I think that fits quite nicely with some, some of the things that Magda has just said about batteries and recycling. Would it be possible uh, to use the kinds of work that you're working on to recycle batteries and, and, and the sort of raw materials that we're finding um, that we need, the, the rare earths and all these other things, um, using the, can we, can we sort of find ways of recycling and reusing them uh, for the things that Magda's doing? Uh, yes, definitely. And that's actually one of the challenges I'll be uh, looking at in the coming years, because in many consumer products, it's not necessarily the, you know, the volume or the mass of the uh, metallic compounds used. It perhaps you use only milligrams, but then that'll be in 10 grams of mobile phone, circuit board and other materials. How are you going to get that back? If it's only you know less than one percent or less than half a percent, having technologies that can uh, re recover uh, and uh, reuse those metallic compounds is really important, and that's actually what bacteria are really good at. They're really good at scavenging and hunting down small quantities of materials and collecting it and using it efficiently. Yeah, and have you looked at batteries specifically? I mean, that seems like a really important thing to be uh, to be uh, reusing because we use so many of them now. <laughs> It's not a material I've directly looked at. I've, we may mean looking at uh, zinc and uh, copper at the moment, but we'll be extending that. We, we looked at copper actually because we're sponsored by a distillery, which is quite an interesting project. <laughs> but uh, but you know, there will be materials like the cobalts and then the other smaller elements, rare earth elements that are used in mobile phones and, yeah. and generators and things like that. And that, that's what I'll be looking at in future. There's no reason why it can't be. It's just you know, applying it and having a look at those particular circumstances and materials and the matrix that those materials are in. Yeah. Um, Judith, let, let me come to you just to, to pick up on something you said earlier. Um, you, you, you framed your discussion earlier about how, you know, we need to change the way we do computing to save energy. And that's, and what, that's one way of tackling the climate issue uh, because reducing energy is, is, a, is, is, a, is a good way of, of reducing carbon emissions. Um, so you're, you know, you're, uh, if, if, if the, the kinds of, of materials you're going to be using to make your chips, what, what kinds of materials are they? And are they things that themselves will take a lot of energy to get out of the ground and process? The thing about silicon is it takes a lot of energy to make those things, but there is a whole entire infrastructure and billions of factories that are already there doing it. And I just wonder what the shift might take in terms of energy. That's a good question. Um, so there are a range of materials that I could use for my memristor elements, actually. Um, but what I really want to do is use what's some that's already being used. So what I want to do, ideally, is to use hafnium oxide, which is used already in the semiconductor industry as a gate dielectric material. So the thing is, it's already used and you want actually very small quantities of it. So in terms of sourcing it, it's not the same as some technologies where you need large volumes. We own very small amounts. So our films are going to be maybe 10 nanometers thick. Of course, you need more material to make, you know, 10 nanometers over a, say, centimeter squared area. You need more material than you actually got in there. But um, we're not talking about large amounts of material. So, you know, it's not a big issue. But it also, if we don't want to use hafnium, we may use others. So there are other simple binary oxides. So one of them could be say TiO2. And so that's already used in um, sunscreens. Um, could be something like zinc oxide, again, already used very widely. So the sourcing of the materials is not the big, biggest issue here. Um, what, what is about, the issue? Yeah, go on. Mean, you carry on. I was going to say, well, what mean, about... You carry on, Judith, you, you take the no, I was going to say what is an issue is, is really, and I think what we actually haven't touched too much across all the talks here, or, or at least three of our talks, is how do you engineer the materials right? So I really want to get that point across because I think, well, we, we've only touched the surface here, but the, the, of the technologies, but the critical thing is how do we actually take the materials that we know might work and actually make them into something useful? That's a really big problem. And that's, that's, part, that's called materials engineering. And um, I think that's a very important area that's 
often very much overlooked. Anyway, I just want to make that point. That's, it's very important. that's the hard. That's clearly the hard part. Uh, it's and, the and, hardest part, and it takes years. And I think you know a lot of people. I want to make that point to the public that people don't understand how long these things take. To the technologies take. It could be twenty years. It could be thirty years. It could be forty years. But that doesn't mean to say it's not worth doing because in the end you're going to get there. You know, if you're really determined, you'll get there. And it was of important. Course. Of course, uh, and and um, Ian, can I come to you on, just to pick up on that, which is that part of it is the engineering of materials, which you know, in your case, uh, we're, we're, you know, working out um, exactly how to you know, create hydrogen, store it, and all of these other things um, in, in a way that's scalable. But also the next part, which is something that perhaps people don't realize so much, is is that you actually have to build enormous. If, if something's successful, you then have to translate that into uh, a manufacturing. A pipeline that, that works and creates things at a reasonable price. I mean, right. how much is that your job and how much is that the government's job to do that sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think in our position, you kind of have to kind of have to start things off because you have to do enough to interest people in the in the technology. And I, th I think that requires demonstration. Um, so I think both elements, if you like, that fundamental material science and then I think demonstration are both part of our job. Um, and if I just uh, actually, there's a lot of, you know, with Judith's work, uh, Judith and I need to talk a bit more, I think. Because um, <laughs> uh, we actually, a lot of what we do, and I suspect we use some similar materials, because actually, uh, I haven't got onto the details of material science and the thermodynamics in what we do, because we probably don't have enough time. But we actually have to use memory as well. Because we're using a cyclic process, we actually have to transfer chemical memory from one half of the cycle to the other half. Because the half of the cycle that makes hydrogen doesn't know how much hydrogen to make unless the reactor actually tells it. So actually the materials within our reactors actually have to perform a role of chemical memory. Um, and I can come back maybe to a bit later on if anybody's interest, interested. But the other part of your question was about scale up. Um, and what we've done so far is we've produced hydrogen um, and we've produced hydrogen at very high efficiencies, much higher you could, than you could do with a normal conventional, conventional process in the laboratory using the, the thermodynamic approach and materials approach we use. I, there is, we have funding and it, it, the, the Royal Academy of Engineering chair uh, also is funding for, provides funding for this to actually then now try and scale up. So we're trying to scale up some of our ideas for hydrogen production by probably three or four orders of magnitude. So to give you an idea, that's um, producing hydrogen, I hope to be able to do it over the next few years, producing hydrogen through these new very efficient processes, enough that would produce, uh, it would um, power a fleet of you know, three or four vehicles, something like that, that kind of scale in, in two or three years. And I've got some industrial, a couple of companies have offered to help me with that in terms of citing a demonstration unit, et cetera. And I think if we can get to that kind of level, that's the kind of level where I think more investors, more companies will take uh, interest, where government might take more interest. Um, uh, but I think it's very much our responsibility to, to take that forward to that kind of level. Uh, it's part of the job, I think. Yeah. In, I feel like it's something that people don't maybe don't realize um, by the time technology or materials or, or practical uses get into people's hands and um, the amount of effort it's taken to get get it to that point where you can manufacture it is probably as much time or if not more than the actual discovery itself, which might have been made 20 years ago. Um, um, yeah, that's right. So, There's an old report somewhere, wasn't there? It was one, for one, but was it for every one an American report? For one dollar you spend on on research, for every one dollar you spend on research, you have to spend sixty three dollars on development to actually get a product out of it that you can sell to somebody. Right. God, it's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I've got some questions from the audience actually, um, which I'll be putting to you as well. So remember, if you want to send questions in, please do just use the Q and A function um, on on the Zoom chat. Um, so the question is to Ian actually. Uh, so, what is it's from someone uh, called Leila Mura, and it says, Ian, very exciting work. I would like to ask, how do you see the future in energy globally, say in 20 or 50 years, in different areas such as the chemical, transport, and electricity? How, how would you see the future energy? Uh, I think we sort of touched on this earlier, is that, that, that there might be a mix of different fuels and technologies, but let's say in 50 years time, um, what does a sustainable energy system look like? Sustainable, yeah, that's a that's a ideally really, for you. I don't I don't want to predict uh, everything, but just you know, what, what would I, you like I mean, to see? I remember once going to an event that was organised by uh, EPSRC uh, in the UK, and you know EPSRC like these um, they 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 like these sort of um, icebreakers at the start of any event, don't they? So we all had to draw a cartoon of what we saw the energy future in fifty years time, 
and everybody drew a lot of plants and all sorts of things growing. I drew a big fission reactor. And I wonder, I just wonder about what about nuclear fission on a 50 year time scale? Do we solve all our problems, you know, using nuclear fission? Or fusion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, of, uh, sorry, actually, yeah, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I meant to say fusion. Yeah, here. You I meant to say fusion, fusion. fine. I meant to, I meant to say fusion, <laughs> it's my mistake. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's really fun well, something about fusion as well. Judith, please, yes. There's a fantastic company in the UK, actually, who we do a bit of work with called Tokamak Energy. Hmm. And they are building a fusion, they are building fusion reactors and they have different stages and different prototypes and um, they're doing really well. And it's quite amazing. I've been to, to see them. So, um, and they have a lot of investment actually from private investors, from city investors. And um, yeah, watch this space. Um, I was at an event just a couple of weeks ago where there were, you know, there were foreign investors in oil rich countries who want to invest in them. So I think it's an exciting space. Yeah. Everyone says it's, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years down the road. But I think I think there's a real chance that it might work. Well, maybe the Royal Academy can uh, listen to you and uh, have another event about fusion, because I feel like you're right. There is something very interesting going on there. Um, a question for you, Magda, from the audience. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, will sodium and potassium batteries have bigger energy density than lithium batteries in theory? In theory, no. In theory, they have a lower energy density because uh, the sodium and potassium is heavier. However, you can always engineer, you can always increase the energy density by engineering the materials. As Judy was saying, it's very important to understand the fundamentals to kind of work backwards on what type of materials, what types of electrodes are needed to have more energy and then you go from materials level to the manufacturing level where potentially having thicker electrodes with better tortuosity is always going to increase the, the the amount of energy you could store per cell um, but no potassium and sodium are complementary to lithium but for other type of applications and um, just a reminder to everyone that you can still submit questions and uh, we've got a few minutes left, so if you've got any questions, then please do submit them. Um, what, one thing that I'd like to ask the, the whole panel, um, which is slightly outside your specific expertise, but I'd like to know how it's affected you. Um, we're talking through Zoom. We're supposed to be meeting uh, somewhere in England right now. This is what the original plan for this event was. Um, and, and, and obviously everyone in the world's plans has, has changed because of COVID-19. Um, I just wonder, for your work, how has this pandemic, uh, and this kind of way of working changed or affected the kind of the kind of the research you're doing, the ability to sort of move forward with all of this. I'd be really interested to hear, Richard. Yeah, well, it's had a a, a major impact, really. Where I'm very much an applied scientist, so I you know I need to visit sewage works. I need to go to you know industrial plants. I I, I need to go to say waste recycling plants, and and I, I need to get my devices or prototypes on those plants and it, it, it has curtailed things where you're not really having that face-to-face -face or that you know flexibility I'm looking at installing a plant or a small device in the well I was meant to be in the next couple of months but now we're in potentially lockdown in South Wales will I be able to get there will I be able to send a research assistant or a PhD student to have a look at it or you know will I have to leave and forget it for a couple of months and it and is that sort of practical things, but also you do miss that sort of face to face and sitting down with, you know, the students eye to eye and, you know, let's talk over the problems. And, you know, sometimes you may have problems in the lab where you can go in, have a quick look and solve a problem. Whereas virtually, you know, you're very much more remote and not as much hands on. I wonder, are there aspects of the way we've changed our working that have made you think about how, well, what lessons you can learn from this situation for you know, how we use resources, materials, energy um, that might help us become more sustainable in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in a way it, it has focused on how we do things. Are we gonna do it efficiently? Do we need to travel as much? Uh, so that means then, you know, it's, it's always a big ask if you're looking at some hydrogen powered cars. Well, if you need to provide all that energy, all that hydrogen, that's a huge ask. But, you know, if only 50% of those uh, road miles are required, you know, it's a lot easier. If you don't need win. many tires or oil, or, you know, it becomes an easier challenge. And what, 
you know it's focusing on those important things that uh at what is essential what is beneficial or what is you know just a way of spending money and <laughs> recouping money magda you, you you wanted to share your thoughts on this I, i'd like to know how this um this way of working has affected your work but also just what makes you think about climate change and sustainability as well i mean it did affect my research massively to the extent that it's been slowed down you know to a pace that's never been slower just because you know i have a large group a limited space so i think what i've learned from this except of all the travel less and everything but but sometimes it's it's is actually much nicer to travel in person to a meeting and meet people you know i don't think that's the future of replacing you don't have the social interaction you can't it's just talking to a screening i don't i don't well i hope it's not going to be the, the norm for the future but in terms of research um it made me think towards automatization a lot you know if i would have had a robot because also when you try to discover the the optimal future battery there is so much of optimization that you do if you would have a robot that could synthesize all these materials and assemble cells for you you know that would have been so it just made me think that probably in the future the importance of having things completely automatized and and coupled with ai and then having students just to think about you know the fundamentals rather than actually doing a million of materials in parallel to the lab that's that's and that's something that I think I want to go into the future because. Yeah, although <laughs> then, you know, isn't part of us a, uh, a PhD or postdoc students training to do very boring drudge work so they understand when they get to your professor level, you know, then you understand the nitty gritty of what, what you're dealing with. Right. Uh, I'll let you think about that one. Uh, Judith, how about you? Uh, to, to um, just give, yeah. again, give me an impression of how it's changed the way you work, but also just, you know, what you think about climate as a result. Um, it hasn't changed too much the way I personally work because um, I don't do things in the lab myself. I, um, so, and also it's been a great opportunity to catch up on writing up lots of papers that we didn't catch, which we didn't do before. So and that's been good for the students as well, actually, that they've been forced to sit down and do that. Otherwise they keep thinking, oh, we need more data. We need more data. Um, but um, no, it's been very hard in terms of uh, the labs haven't been open and we just can't do stuff without the labs being open. And even though they're open now, they're not open 24 seven. And, and in my group and all of the university, those labs are used 24 seven. People are always clamoring to get on equipment because a lot of students and there's not so much equipment. So, um, so yeah, so, and then and, you know, in terms of the energy of the future based on this, what we've learned now, it's true that we don't need to do all that traveling. Absolutely not. I was always protesting about it anyway. Like I'd go off to meetings and say, well, why can't we just do this online, you know? Yes, you do have to meet some people in person sometimes, though. You can't do it all online. It's not the same, um, but you can do it a lot less, I think. So, so that, I think, is a positive thing. Um, I think it's, but certainly for older people like me who've been doing this for so many years, but I think for the younger people, it is hard and they do need that human interaction. And while they might do boring experiments, re repeating things in the lab, actually, I think that's probably more healthy for them than programming a, ro programming a robot. I think they'd probably be depressed sitting at home doing that. So <laughs> <laughs> being active in the lab is not such a bad thing, even if it can be a bit tedious at times. Ian, uh, I assume, again, you have deal, you have machines and pipelines and uh, chemical processes you need to monitor. You can't do everything remotely. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I mean, I feel a little bit like Judith personally, it hasn't actually affected me very much. I mean, the research group are now going to shoot me. It took a long time to get them back into the lab and, and get them doing all the things they need to do in the lab. But again, like, like Judith, we had lots of papers to write up that we hadn't got around to writing up and it's been a good time for that. But I think what it's made me realize is that there are a couple of things that are really hard to do through Zoom and through Teams. And they're extremely important to the way they work, we work. And the thing I've noticed is innovation. Actually, I'm just um, treading water the last six months. You know, we're writing up papers for ideas we've already had. We're working our way through. We're working on what we need to work. How do you really innovate when you do everything over Zoom? And I kind of need to get the energy from being with people and physically being with people and kicking ideas around. And I'd really like to know, it makes you think more about how you might do that better in our current circumstance, but also when life returns to normal, how can we, how can we learn from and innovate better? And the other thing I'm particularly worried about right now is team building because the new PhD student starts 
and it's starting and how do you build teams around people to ta- teams of people to tackle these problems when you've never physically met the people so again we're having lots of zoom meetings and trying to doodle on whiteboards you know virtually but how do we tackle team building which again is a big part of obviously academic research any research environment uh, using the tools that we've current that we currently have to work with yeah it, it feels like um, you've had the same problems uh, sim- very similar problems in terms of team building that all of us have which is which is that the you're working on the ideas that you've had six months ago from the communications that we've already made with people and uh, and now the question is how do you get new ones because it, it, right. I think we, we underappreciate how important it is to have stimulation around us of some sort, whether it's other people or other places. Yeah. Um, question from the audience to Dr. Driscoll. Uh, you mentioned uh, neuromorphic applications. Uh, this is from Peter Kim, uh, one of the audience members. You, you mentioned neuromorphic applications. Will it be possible to implement external memory storage device in the brain to overcome things like Alzheimer's? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, Well, of course, we don't really fully understand how memory works in the brain, although scientists have been making big advances in that in recent years, I believe, not that I'm an expert on it. So I think unless we fully understand how memory works in the brain, um, it's very hard then to just have an external memory device and, and put all that in there. We'd have to somehow store it in that memory device your whole life as you're growing up from a baby, as you're learning to walk, learning to talk, learn to eat, and that, that is just beyond, I think, what we can do right now. That's very complex. Um, I think one day that will be possible. I know, you know, they've been taking slices of brains of famous people and, and storing them away for the day that we do understand how those, all those little neurons and things are work and connect together. But um, not quite yet, I think. Yeah, that, that's, that seems... <laughs> Seems far away, but um, but but I was I'm surprised. I thought you would just say you would say that it's that that's just not at all related. But it sounds like it might even be possible at some point in the future. I think so. I think you know it's hard to imagine, but I think in the future we will do. Since there is there are great advances in that area. We need we need some you know a neuromorphic person here from biology to tell us more about that. I think, but um, great advances have been made in how how the brain is working and how it stores yeah. memory. But um, you know, I was just thinking the other day, why is it that I can remember? You, if you think about your past when you were a child, you remember sort of images, don't you? An, a single image, but why can I remember one thing but not remember another thing? And so understanding those sorts of things is very basic things about why you have a picture of something, of some event in the past, but not the whole set. We need to understand that before we can store the whole lot, right? Plus also the fact that different people have very different memories of different things, uh, you know, completely different uh, m- memories of the same event um, and so on. Yeah, I think I think human memory itself is, is a complex thing, never mind trying to reproduce it somewhere else. Um, I, I'd like to know, um, in general, again, from, from, from all of you, you're doing things or you're looking at research questions that are all about, you know, sustainability and tackling small parts of this huge sort of environmental challenge that we have. How do you ensure, though, that the, the, the new ideas that you're coming up with, the new materials you're making, the new processes you're creating, are not the, in themselves going to be huge environmental catastrophes in the future, if I can put it in that way. I don't mean, I don't mean that they will be, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, in, in the 100 years ago, and people coming up with all sorts of, when, when people coming up with, during the Industrial Revolution 150, 200 years ago, People were, didn't know the carbon dioxide would cause the problems that it did. But, you know, it was a great thing at the time. So, I mean, I don't want you to say that you'll be able to predict everything, but what, what, what sort of philosophical and strategic ways do you have now to try and make sure that the, the, the challenges you're trying to solve don't cause more problems in the future? I just wonder, would anyone be happy to I'll take that? Yes, Richard. Yeah, well, I, I think, fortunately, we, we, we do have history to sort of help us that, you know, there has been certain bad things that, you know, CFCs or lead in petrol. And I, I think we, we, we're we much more well aware of those sort of, um, you know, scientific uh, uh, issues that are had negative effects. And I, I think we, we're always trying to push and question and, you know, critically evaluate 
is it going to be better? You know, are we going to not cause greater problems to be solving? And I, I think it becomes much more fundamental into um, your thought processes and how you develop the technology. So in a way, I'm sort of optimistic that we will avoid those issues. But again, it may be foolish because, you know, there's the known knowns and then the unknown knowns and then the unknown unknowns. And so. Right, right. Yes, Magda. I would say it's not up to us necessarily scientists. It would be great if it would be. It's up to the stakeholder and people that are making the money and they need to understand this. And well, obviously it's our role to convince them with new technologies, but as you know, it's very hard when something has been implemented and makes a profit. How do you convince someone to change? So I think that is a very big challenge. Ian or Judith, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I, I think it's very hard. It's very hard to anticipate, isn't it? I think there are lots of things that we can't anticipate, and, and maybe it sounds a little bit naive, but um, the way in the long term to address these issues, if we could have a culture of openness, where when problems are suspected that they can be they can be reported early, uh, and that as a result, as a size society, we could start to address these earlier. That would be very very helpful because. These problems won't be recognised till you know. In some cases, when these technologies have, have probably been possibly been in use for quite some time, and uh, I think we have to be able to then respond to those challenges. But the, you know, the most important thing I think would be sharing information. If we could somehow encourage that, that people to share information and concerns. Okay, another question from the audience, from Anna Cavalcanti. Uh, question for you all: What will a ten-year program enable? that you could not do with a sequence of individual projects? It's a good question. This sounds like the Royal Academy of Engineering. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I don't believe it is from them. I think it's genuinely a question from the audience. So uh, may, may, maybe Judith, what, what would a 10 year program allow you to do? Um, and again, um, I think some people will be familiar with how academic careers work, but most people won't. So give us a sense of, of what you can do in that okay, time. So, I mean, no, normally, you know, you, you get a grant and if you're lucky, you get a three year grant. Sometimes you'll get a five year grant. But to have a 10 year grant is something really different. And I think, you know, the uh, Royal Academy have been have created a fantastic scheme for scientists because, you know, we are, you, you get the grant and no sooner you get the grant, you're trying to get the next grant. So you spend a lot of time <laughs> applying for money. That's what scientists do. Um, it just gives you the, the space to relax a bit. And um, especially with flexibility of funding, because that's another key thing. The, the funding they've given us is quite flexible. It's not confined to, you know, you spend 10 pounds on this new chemical or you spend 50 pounds on this trip. It's quite flexible and I think flexibility and, and long duration allows you to relax and to think about a bigger picture and to not just stop and start. You can have a long term person in place really tackling a complex and difficult problem and that's really important. Yeah, maybe if I, if I, if I could add something, I think in my case I've got a clear, if you like a clear goal for demonstration, there's something I want to demonstrate on sort of a three to five year timescale in terms of hydrogen production. So it allows me to do a bit of materials engineering that I need to do and, and, and to go, go ahead with that demonstration, which would be quite difficult with an existing grant with, with the way they work. But more than that, it allows me to learn from the demonstration and then go to next generation materials. And it allows me to build relationships with the kind of companies might be interested in these technologies. And follow on from the demonstration, having that kind of timescale. So it's a really exciting opportunity. Yeah, I would, I would add in there that it does give you that time and space to you know, build relationships with companies so you can actually start deploying your technology because it, you know, it, it is a long-term thing you need to do. And companies do change emphasis on time to time and it allows you that platform so you're not being overly evangelical at the times and so you can say well look here's a technology this is what we can do now this is what we can do in future you know and it takes it much more forward way you can undertake learning experiences and uh, you know adjust and improve or have an alternative commercialization strategy Amanda? yeah i guess everything has been much said but but yeah it gives you that flexibility not to worry about you know your next high impact paper to get the next grant to publish the next impact paper to get the next grant. It gives you think time to think and also 
It enables you to potentially make a real impact in the world with your discoveries. And that's what I, I for example, uh, hired someone that will be exactly responsible for that, um, trying to translate my discoveries into like real world practice, try to get a new battery technology. I'll try to talk to industry. And without this, I, I wouldn't have had the time because there's, there's so many things we are asked to do. Yeah. And can I propose to you that you know, I don't know if you agree with me or not, is that a 10 year program does all the things you've described, but also allows you to fail at certain things. You can have ideas that don't work. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, is that something that is possible elsewhere in, 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 in your, uh, Judith, in your two year, three year grants? Yes, actually, I feel I feel more obliged to make it work than I would in a normal <laughs> two or three year grant. That's just, that's just personal pressure because you're a perfectionist, clearly. <laughs> well, maybe, but I think, you know, because we're saying we're all aiming towards a technology and to getting really something, um, a, you know, there's a very clear end goal in terms of technology. Um, I think there's, you, you know, there is a real focus on that, whereas in a normal standard government grant from EPSRC or something it's it tends to be I know they want their specific milestones but I think probably there's less expectation of you in terms of getting the technology out so there is more chance to fail with that so I, I yeah I feel actually a bit more pressure actually <laughs> but, um, but still at the same time it's still a great thing <laughs> and branding right? the branding itself calling you this chair is fantastic because then industry look at you and they say oh this person that's their role that's their specific role and they're much more likely to work with you than if you're just your regular professor in the university right so i, I, love I, much. I guess also being called an emerging an emerging yeah. technology implies to people that it's at the start of the process the long process to getting it onto any sort of commercial basis right it's not going to be ready packaged already and, and there's going to be lots of innovation and and experimentation to come and um, which leads to a question from the audience as well, um, uh, from, an, uh, from anonymous attendee again. Uh, this is for the whole panel. Um, how important is it to be able to translate innovation that being developed in a lab to policymakers to effectively roll out um, on, an, on an impact? I assume it means how, how do you make, make an impact with the work you're doing? Uh, what role do you yourself see playing in that translation? Um, Richard, you know, if you, in the work you're doing, if you come up with two or three processes that are really interesting and you think could have big impact, um, how, how important is it to force it out into the world? And, and what, what's, what's your role in that? Where does it stop? Um, well, it, it, it stops fully with you. You, you. Again, you have to be evangelical about it, that you've got to promote it and be you know, able to promote it. And have, you know, have the, that free time to you know, address people's worries and, and uh, and, and solve problems for people, and I, I think that that's a huge benefit. It is, you know, freeing up freeing up that time so you can engage and solve and deploy. It. And that's uh... uh, Magda. What about new battery technology? You know, how important? What's your role in making it actually appear in the world? Um. Well, battery technologies. That there's so many different options for new battery technologies. I think what we are lacking in the UK is materials for new battery technologies and, um, and also capabilities of yeah, um, going into new technologies. Now, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you know, look at Tesla. They had that uh, amazing dream and now they're, they're this global lithium ion battery technology, whether you know, it is possible that a new battery technology and, and that's not going to be sodium because there are already a lot of big players into the market as well, but, but maybe something else. It is possible mm. that it's going to emerge. You mm. never know. You just need to, first of all, start with the basics. And then if you see promise, try to convince people to invest in you and, um, and try to make it work. And again, for batteries, you have to look at the niche applications, you know, um, what is what is it suitable for? Um, Ian, a question from you for you from um, the audience. Um, what does Ian think about hydrogen from water? Using fossil fuels is not sustainable. 
Well, hydrogen from water, you've got to put energy in, obviously, to get hydrogen from water. So actually, that when the, the process I talked about there was actually a way of splitting water, which provides the energy from the fossil fuels. So you, you, you know, the other way of doing it, of course, is electrolysis. It would be the other way you would use or thermally split water, but the most common one you would find nowadays, if you wanted to split water, would be electrolysis. Hmm. Um, so you'd put in electrical energy to generate hydrogen. Actually, that would be much more expensive than using a fossil fuel at the moment. Uh, maybe what we go to in the future, but that's part of the problem. Actually, we are effectively making hydrogen from water, and it's the way you know you've got to do that as cheaply and as cleanly as you can. And that balance is going to change as things go forward. And ultimately, we may be doing it from electrolysis, but at the moment, it's a lot cheaper and can potentially be clean doing it with fossil fuels. But we're not going to want to do it like that way forever. Yeah, and I guess also. Um it will depend on what the rest of the energy system looks like. Um, if, if, you know, if our fusion power does come along in 50 years time and we've got unlimited free electricity, we can create hydrogen however you like, just, uh, just, mm. stick, a, just stick a fuel cell down somewhere and, and you can create it. Absolutely right. Everything energy, you know, you, you may try and it's very difficult to come up with the right answer for us right now. Mm. The one thing you can be sure about is that right answer for, the, for this moment is going to be different in the future. And so you're going to have to continually ask yourself these questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 we're coming towards the end of our session. So if people have got more questions, then please do submit them on the chat. There's been some great ones so far. And um, our, our panelists are very happy to answer uh, all, all of them for you. Um, uh, here's another one from to Richard. Um, will you, oh, yes, good one. Um, will you be, genetically modifying bacteria that you use in your work? It's, it's not a primary tool that I will be using as such, but we can use it, the, that knowledge to either uh, develop and understand. Normally I, I sort of use wild type organisms that have that ability and then I, I make them do what I want them to do more than engineering them to do can that. You, can you give me an example? I mean, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, for example, in, in uh, when we run our lab scale ones to generate electricity, we take back to you that are normally in a sewage treatment plant anyway. All we do is design the reactor so we can extract that energy. The bacteria have this ability anyway. It may not be uh, fully developed or fully exploited, which we, we try to do with engineering the bioreactor to do that. Uh, the issue with sort of genetic modification, it, it may be possible in, in certain biotechnology for products or pharmaceuticals where we have a closed reactor. Uh, and then possibility, yes, I will use it for those sort of higher value products, yes. Okay, um, a question for the panel from Themis Prodromakis. Um, large manufacturing for most of these emerging technologies occurs in the Far East. How much is the lack of UK-based manufacturing affecting our R&D in these important areas? Good question. Um, you know, you, you know, the, clearly the new ideas in science are happening here, uh, and 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 you you four are the leaders in that. But when you come to actually manufacturing, um, is it all going to go elsewhere? Um, Judith. Actually, I, so I should say actually, um, I introduced Temis here because Temis also has a chair in emerging technologies. Oh, okay, the, fine. <laughs> okay, so similar area to mine, but perhaps a little bit more applied and on the on the AI side. Um, oh, well, welcome, Dennis. So, yeah. So uh, he has a very good point, of course, that um, if it's a complex technology and it's going to take a lot of time and you need a lot of investment for the machinery, that is that's going to be a challenge. Um, and so a typical UK model is to have a startup company, as he, he has himself, and, you know, to develop things uh, bit by bit and grow. And then then what's typically happened is, is those companies have been bought out by those companies in the Far East or the US. Um, but maybe now with uh, Brexit and uh, the government saying they're going to be investing more in these areas and trying to keep technology in the UK, maybe things will change. I think we have to be hopeful and positive for that. Oh, well, you, you, you started the B word now. That's not yeah, the thing we talk about that. But, <laughs> but, but actually, it's a good point. Um, if you are going to build this manufacturing, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. But it takes a long time to build up the amount of manufacturing you would want to create advanced technologies, right? You don't just you can't even build um, it, a, 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 sil a, silic, a, a, a factory to create silicon chips within five or 10 years. It takes that long to do that. So it's not easy. Let's just not let people go away thinking we can just build this stuff tomorrow. 
Um, Ian, well, what, what do you have to say about that question about the, the yeah, no, it, is, it is a very interesting question, and I think it can it can be a bit of a concern. You know, if you think of the, the kind of things that I work on, hydrogen production, clearly in Western Europe, North America, we have incumbent technologies. We've got steam methane reforming on a large scale. It produces a lot of hydrogen. I guess hydrogen demand is probably has probably increased or could increase much faster in the Far East. So you could imagine that they would be uh, more open to new processes and investing in, in, in new technologies. So you, you could see that happening. I mean, the other, the other concern, of course, is if companies uh, feel threatened by a new technology, um, so incumbent hydrogen manufacturers feel threatened by a new technology, there is, of course, there's, there is also the possibility that they, they may try and, and buy any early technology or early or, or a startup and actually squash the technology, keep it under control rather than having another competitor. So there's all sorts of, I think, rather complex dynamics. And certainly the level of development of different eco economies and how technology might move around is part of that concern. But I think it's even more complex than that. Um, Magda, do you have any thoughts on manufacturing? I mean, it's all very well having an idea in a lab, but what, what if you can't build it? I mean, just to say that, um, again, um, the World Economic Forum has also predicted annual revenues of $300 billion um, by 2030 from batteries. And the largest from this, about 45%, comes from the manufacturing. And then this is followed by refining operations and recycling has the smallest percentage. And so for lithium ion batteries, there's no way UK is going to compete with China. No, I mean, that, that is my personal opinion, but I'm not very optimistic and I don't think Brexit helps a lot in, in this respect. But maybe there are lessons to learn from this data and maybe if we are to create a new battery technology, you know, UK has to invest from early on and not let it go somewhere else. Because in the end, John Goodenough discovered he was from Oxford and the manufacturing went completely somewhere else. And UK is very good at this, discovering great materials, great potential technologies, and then letting it go. So eventually, I hope that they'll, they'll learn from the past mistakes and try to keep the technology here. Richard, is that is that right? That uh, the UK is great at coming up with this stuff and then letting it slip away somewhere else? Yes, or, or, or we sell it on rather cheaply. I, I think we, we do still have actually a, a good deal amount of manufacturing expertise and resource there but i i don't think we're or financial investors don't seem to be willing to sort of invest in that so it drives forward and you know it, with automation it, it is your manufacturing you know can ha have huge volumes with relatively low uh, amount of people involved so it's not necessarily that we don't need you know a million workers to manufacture these things it is you know automation can come in it's, it's development and actually are you prepared to fight for that market I, you know i think market the availability and accessibility to markets drives how much manufacturing you're prepared to do really well, it's a good job we're not uh, changing our market structures right now in any sort of significant way in that case um, look i i, I uh, there are a few more questions but i feel like perhaps it's time to wind up um, because it's been such an interesting conversation and, and we could carry on talking for ages and I'm sure that everyone has other things they need to get doing. Uh, so um, I just want to say that we you know because we've, we've heard some very different approaches to advancing sustainability with engineering being the sort of key enabler in, in a lot of it all and it's, it's amazing to hear the different avenues that our panelists and others are taking but also embedding this idea of sustainability, climate, the, the embedding the idea of recyclability right from the beginning. Um, it's really promising and exciting. Um, as we've heard, these technologies all have the potential to secure long-lasting and positive changes, to create uh, decarbonized industrial economies. And if you want to learn more, you can go to the Royal Academy of Engineering website for further information about um, the Academy strategy and also about all of the panelists and, and the kinds of work they're doing. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you to our panelists, uh, Professor Richard Dinsdale, uh, Professor Judith Driscoll, Professor Ian Sachs, Lee Metcalf, and Professor Magda Titorici. Um, and thank you also to everyone who's taken part in this event and, and submitted questions and just all just listened. Um, thank you very much for your participation. And we hope to see you more at um, some of the other Royal Academy Engineering events as well. So goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.